Hello, this is Dr. David Green, founder and CEO of R3 Stem Cell International. Today we're discussing quality assurance standards for stem cell biologics, such as those we use at R3 International. So here's an outline of what I'll go through. First is where do the biologics come from? What tissues are included? How are they processed? What does the FDA require here in the U.S.? And then what are we looking to prevent, such as communicable diseases, versus what we're looking to promote, such as high cell counts. And then I'll discuss what are the actual risks involved. So first of all, where do these biologics actually come from? Well, what we're using is allogeneic tissue, which means it comes from a donor. And these are consenting donors after a scheduled C-section. Why do we use a C-section? Well, first of all, it's scheduled, right? So we have time to get the consent form from the mother, also perform a hefty screening process where blood work is taken, there's a large list that the FDA requires. In addition, there's a mental health questionnaire, and the medical director will review the medical records from the mother as well. Uh, another reason it's a scheduled C-section is because of sterility. You know, it's a sterile procedure in the operating room, so contamination is absolutely minimized, if not eliminated. And then the yield. You get a full um, placenta, umbilical cord tissue, and amniotic fluid. If you use a vaginal birth, there's some issues with potential contamination of bacteria. And also, the water has broken hours before, so you don't get the amniotic fluid. So that's more reasons why a scheduled C-section. So when you're talking about what the tissue is that is normally considered medical waste after a scheduled C-section, it's the umbilical cord, the placenta, and the amniotic fluid. The mother's fine, the baby's fine, and this tissue is then, instead of being discarded, you know, it's, it's taken to the lab for processing. Uh, just a, one slide on the ethics involved here. Like I said, this is tissue that's normally discarded. There's no harm to the baby or mother at all. There's no embryonic stem cells. Um, we only use mesenchymal or hematopoietic. And there's no compensation. So um, it's not that you know we, we wouldn't like to pay the mother. It's just that ethicists have decided, because this is a procedure that normally is, is undergone um, you know, to have the baby, then you're not supposed to, to pay the mother for that like you would for an egg donation. All right, so let's talk about the quality assurance processing. Uh, we'll go through pre-processing, the processing itself, storage, distribution, and reporting mechanisms. So in the pre-processing, the quality assurance begins with review of the donor's medical history. So as I mentioned, the medical director will go through um, a lot of things. One is looking for blood-borne pathogens. Another is a review of the mother's medication history, uh, whether there's a hereditary or non-hereditary diseases or anomalies. Looking at a history of alcohol, drugs, uh, tobacco products, vaping, and then a history of tattoos. So it's pretty extensive. Only about 10% of eligible donors you know, who would like to donate make it through that process and become eligible. When the C-section actually occurs, um, as I mentioned, it's a sterile procedure in the operating room. Um, and when the tissue is obtained, um, it goes into a sterile container. Uh, it's immediately taken to the lab for processing because time is precious with live cells and it's processed right away. It doesn't sit there for a few days, you know, until, you know, like over the weekend or something like that. So where does the processing occur? Well, in the United States, um, these are FDA certified labs who are registered with the FDA. They get inspected um, every year or so uh, to make sure that they're um, up to, to snuff, which I'll show you in a second. Um, in Mexico, the FDA uh, type of, of company is called Cofapris, and they certify labs there. They do inspections too, um, and you know if, if the FDA decertifies a lab or Cofapris, then you know we're not going to work with them. So what are we looking to prevent? Well, here's an actual product analysis certificate that. Uh, shows what was evaluated for as far as bacteria, communicable diseases. So uh, first of all, you see Lyme disease being checked, Chaga, uh, CMV, hepatitis, um, HIV, 
uh, syphilis, um, more tests for hepatitis, West Nile virus, and then sterility. That looks at, uh, for bacteria, whether it's gram positive or gram negative, and then culturing to make sure there's no uh, growth uh, present. So that's pretty extensive testing. It's not done at the lab itself. It's actually sent out to a third party that's accredited um, by a company called CLIA. All right, so the FDA lays out what it means to be CGMP, which stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices. And it might sound a little bit nebulous, but when you actually look at the systems that are in place, they're very specific. Strong quality management systems, uh, obtaining appropriate quality raw materials that you're going to use during the processing, robust operating procedures. So if you go into a lab that's CGMP compliant, they'll have extensive policy and procedure manuals showing exactly how they perform the processing, monitor it, track everything, every step is, is um, written down and tracked. Um, detecting and investigating product quality deviations, um, maintaining reliable testing laboratories. So it's not worth getting into the nitty gritty uh, of the specifics of these, uh, but it is a very robust uh, process. Now, once the tissue is, is finished with the processing, it stays in a quarantine freezer for two weeks. And it's a liquid nitrogen uh, style freezer, negative 192 degrees Celsius. And like I said, the testing occurs at a third party lab. It takes about two weeks. And if all the testing comes back negative, then and only then can the tissue be sent out, you know, for use. If anything comes back positive, all of it gets discarded. So traceability. If a problem were to occur with a procedure, then every vial needs traceability back to the donor. Okay, so um, that, that's the, one of the reasons that with CGMP compliance, every step of the processing gets tracked uh, very specifically. So if there is a potential recall necessary, then the lab would be able to know exactly where that tissue came from, where else it was sent to, what they, where they need to contact to get recall. Um, you know, that's what, what we're talking about there. Now, additionally, we're looking to prevent mutations and tumors. So let's get into that. Uh, first of all, let's talk about culturing. In the United States, uh, cultured biologics are not allowed to be used. The FDA calls that maximal manipulation, um, but you can do it internationally. So we use cultured biologics frequently. Uh, there is a concern over mutations when you do culturing because you're going, you know, replicate, replicate, replicate. Our labs use something called karyotyping to look for mutations. And if there's, you know, a bunch of them, then it's all discarded. Uh, there is also concern over over culturing. If you culture a biologic over and over and over and over and over too many times, then you're going to make those stem cells um, non-functional. It's called senescence. Okay, so we make sure that uh, that does not happen. Um, our specimens are only cultured uh, upwards of five times, and that's it. Um, so it's also important to evaluate for stem cell counts and uh, exosomes with surface markers, not just with a cell counter. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But I want to show you a couple papers of how, uh, for instance, Wharton's jelly stem cells. Wharton's jelly is part of the umbilical cord. Um, that is very uh, uh, specific for tons of stem cells, uh, but that does not induce uh, tumors. So this was an animal study um, where they received human Wharton's jelly stem cells, and none of these animals developed tumors um, at all. Um, this was a, a human study uh, for the tumorigenicity evaluation of umbilical cord blood-derived mesenchymal stem cells. And what they showed is that both in the lab and in, um, inside the body, the umbilical cord blood stem cells did not exhibit any uh, tumor potential. So very safe from that regard. Now we're also looking to prevent rejection. That would really uh, stink if you got a stem cell biologic and your body rejected it, right? So uh, will it cause rejection? Here's a great paper from 2007 about cord blood, you know, do you need immune suppression like you would for an organ transplant? Well, let's look at this. In the 1930s, cord blood was actually used for transfusions. There was a big shortage of um, 
blood donors at the time. They didn't even have HLA matching back then, and they didn't have any adverse events in many procedures. 1999 to 2004, there was a study of 129 patients who got cord blood, and they didn't have ABO matching or HLA matching, and they didn't have any rejections, and they followed these patients for up to four years. So there has not been any evidence of graft versus host, ed- host disease with cord blood treatments. Um, actually, uh, in this day and age, cord blood is now used for treatment of graft versus host disease. Um, so that's how amazing it can be. Now here's another paper, the impact of graft recipient ABO compatibility. Um, and what they found is that in 270 patients, whether they didn't even check for ABO status and it didn't seem to impact outcomes at all. There was no rejection. One last study, this one's fantastic. Donor to recipient ABO mismatch does not impact outcomes of allogeneic uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation. So it didn't matter if it was matched, unrelated. Um, ABO matching is not a critical factor because no rejection is seen. All right, so we're also looking to prevent stem cell death. You know, if you're getting a stem cell therapy, obviously you want to get live cells, and a lot of them. So here's some things that can cause stem cell death. One is if the tissue uh, is delayed in the processing. That can be a problem. Cells can die. If you use too much preservative, um, it doesn't preserve the tissue. It actually can kill it. Radiation, I have no idea why labs use radiation except maybe to save some money during the processing. Uh, It's terrible. It kills live cells, um, and it's just a bad practice. Using uh, too many reagents, uh, handling the tissue very rough, or using very poor cryogenic technique can kill cells by membrane shock, um, things like that. So what type of cells are in the umbilical cord? Uh, there's a lot. Hematopoietic stem cells have been shown to be superior to those in adult bone marrow in basically every way. There's angiogenous stimulating cells, ASCs. There's mesenchymal stem cells, and those have shown the ability to transform into neuronal, hepatic, osteoblastic, cardiac, uh, chondrocyte cell lines. Uh, there's a lot of exosomes, which are stem cell byproducts, fantastic uh, for helping with regeneration. Um, In the umbilical cord, the mesenchymal stem cells are capable of uh, replication up to 20 times without uh, having significant problems. Bone marrow is only up to 5, and adipose, which is fat, is only up to about 8. So it's much more proliferative. All right, so uh, the analogy that I use for the umbilical cord tissue, all the different cells and proteins, is that of an orchestra. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know what all these sections are. I just know there's a lot of different sections, okay? Those sections are akin to these different cells and proteins that combine together, just like the instruments do, to make the sum greater than the parts. So what you're talking about here is not just stem cells, but tons of growth factors, exosomes, secretomes, microRNA, cytokines, I spelled that wrong, but anyway, there's a ton of different regenerative elements in play, and you don't want to use radiation or too much preservative to kill them, because they're all important. Now, when you use um, poor technique with cryogenic freezing, you can get crystal formation, osmotic shock, membrane damage, um, and that's all terrible. Proper technique involves minimal preservative, uh, no more than, say, 10%, Establish vitrification techniques, which is a very fast method of freezing. Um, it goes in less than a second from 37 degrees to negative 196 degrees. So that can be very effective, um, and it takes a uh, knowledgeable you know, scientist to make that in place at a, at a good lab. That's what we use. All right, so let's switch and look to what we are trying to promote. One is cell counts. Uh, Another is intact variety of regenerative elements, i.e. the full orchestra. We want to make sure there's not just a lot of cells, but that the activity of those cells is in place. Biocompatibility, meaning no rejection. We want to make sure it's cost-effective. If it costs way too much to make a biologic, you know, then who's going to be able to afford a treatment? And then, after all that, great outcomes. 
So here's an example of how our labs look at cells and, and exosomes to see if they're present. They don't just run it through a cell counter, but they also look at surface markers, which makes it very specific for, you know, if we say a product has 30 million stem cells, these are the kinds of, of methods used to show that. So for instance, exosomes have specific surface markers. You can see here CD9, 63, 81, and this looks at those specifically. Because if you just run them through a, like a cell counter and look at size, there's lots of other things that can be that size, like trash proteins and dead cells, and you get these inflate, inflated counts. So the goal and the reality is that there are many studies to date have shown that umbilical cord tissue is safe for clinical use, including Wharton's jelly and umbilical cord blood components. You don't need preconditioning or ABO matching. The tissue does not lead to tumors. It's non-tumorogenic. Um, it does not lead to rejection. It's called immune privileged. Any adverse events uh, in all the studies and our experience with over 15,000 procedures to date have been mild to moderate and resolved within 24 or 48 hours. What have we seen with the biologics? Uh, maybe a low-grade fever for a day, um, some dizziness or lightheadedness, maybe a little bit of nausea, um, maybe some chills, and the chills are usually because maybe the IV fluid is a little cooler than, than the body. Uh, we do a warm it up, though. Um, basically, things like that. Um, the indications for umbilical cord tissue continues to expand very rapidly as each year goes by. So let me tell you about our international treatment program. We have several clinics and we're growing um, every year. We have three clinics in Mexico now, uh, one in Pakistan, and then you know, in addition to what we have in the US. But uh, the clinics are only 20 minutes from the airports, whether it's the San Diego airport going across the border, it's very fast. Cancun is only 20 minutes, same with um, Mexicali, um, and then Islamabad as well. The process is simple. It starts with a free phone consultation with one of our licensed, experienced stem cell doctors. Um, they will look at your medical records, will help you obtain those if necessary, uh, give you the time to answer your questions, and then come up with uh, whether or not you are a candidate. Uh, we looked at our data from last year. We turn away about 20% of individuals for various reasons. Um, so everybody is just not a candidate. We don't want to give unrealistic expectations. Um, then you would have a patient concierge representative to assist you with all the travel logistics, uh, including you know, flights and uh, ground transportation. The ground transportation is included in any procedure pricing. The cells, we talked a lot about cells during this presentation, uh, but we do have a pristine safety record. Um, the quality assurance is more stringent than the FDA. Um, if it's in the U.S., obviously it it's abides by the FDA and, and above. In Mexico, the quality assurance, I've done videos on this, is just head and shoulders above what the FDA requires. Uh, we do culture the umbilical cord stem cells. We use minimal uh, preservative, less than 10%, um, or in some cases, no preservative. Um, we can get the cells there the same day as the procedure. Um, so what you end up with is anywhere from 90 to 95 percent viability. If we have to cryopreserve, it ends up killing about 5 percent of the cells. We overculture to compensate for that. And these are pure, potent stem cells below the fifth generation, as I mentioned. So R3 has been featured on every media channel you can think of. Um, this year we were named the USA's leading regenerative therapies provider. Um, so the process is, is easy to start. You can visit us at r3stemcell.com. Um, you can live chat with us. You can fill out a contact form or just call us. Use the USA prefix and then 888-988-0515. And as long as you use the USA prefix, it'll work worldwide. All right, thank you so much for watching. Visit our website. Like I said, you'll see a lot of educational information, more videos, and we look forward to speaking with you.